Yeah, man, they're my biggest supporters. I love my parents. And tell it like it is, get down to the facts, cause I'm a lyrical whiz when it comes down to this. Free stop flipping, the could be a say the lines and rise, my words start fitting to the soul rhythm. Yes, the soul rhythm. So people, yo, you better start listening. Yo, biz, yo, you know my man. Get on the mic and do the best you can. I'm the Beyonce Yamaza, A-R-K Arafa. Different kind of rhythm or rhyme, look like a maxima. I rock a microphone down to the beat. You couldn't believe that I'm a so cool tree. The original, the beat. And they all for okay, I was the ease. All the people they are by your knees. Because I know I feel like RP. You hear me, you know I'm down with a crew. The man that didn't have a one we do. Singing fresh and get respect to have her. Rock from here to like the Queen's Plaza. I'm Salute. Keep the music playing. Keep the music playing. Let's do it. <laughs> Yo, I have the down bottom beyond these and a few more people join in and then we're gonna get into some history. It's the C A P I to the T, the capital T. Yeah, yo, what's the high technique? Well, we have to Paul C, yes sir. My name is B. Yes, absolutely. Rest in peace, Raw uh, Paul, Paul C. Lives. Paul C. Lives. Absolutely. The shirt, the shirt says it on the back. That's right. First yeah. of all, I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity. Uh, this is uh, full circle for me. Like I said, uh, you and Biz uh, were uh, my first concert back in 1989. Uh, my parents took me to that concert. I was too young to go. So, uh, and here we are talking today. So. Um, like I said, thank you so much for the opportunity. Hey, man, I see you out there working, and you deserve everything that's coming to you. You're working hard. You're pushing. You, you, you're pressing the buttons. You ain't scared to ask nobody if they want to do an interview. You, you're putting the content out there. Hey, that's what I'm talking about, man. Hey, I love the underdog. Appreciate that so much. Uh, we got a lot of history to get into, as well as uh, giving you your flowers. Uh, while you're here and all the accomplishments that you have uh, done throughout the year, uh, throughout the years and your books, uh, your your uh, radio station, all that stuff. We're going to get into it. Uh, but we want to take it all the way back to the beginning. This is History Lesson, episode 122. Uh, this is the legendary Cutmaster Cool B. If you could tell us where you were born and raised. Elizabeth, New Jersey. <laughs> when you land at Newark Airport, you land on top of my house. I'm three lights from the airport, you know, so Elizabeth is right next to Newark. So no Newark, New Jersey, if you're flying into Newark International, you're flying, you're landing on Cool V's house. <laughs> what was a day in the life like for DJ Cool V, uh, better known as Bon Lee, as a teenager growing up in uh, New Jersey? Oh, man, listen, just like every other person around the way, man. I, I mean, I, we could all sit back and try to think of the hardest things we've been through 
But, you know, I had a, a, a fun childhood. You know, we were poor just like everybody else. And I just, you know, I'm just glad to be able to make idolize other people that have made it, you know, because a lot of people don't know people that's from my town. We got a lot of professional boxers. Um, Duke Booty that wrote the message and produced the message with Belly Mel, Furious Five, Sugar Hill Records, you know, all of that from Elizabeth, New Jersey. So that's the history, man. We we, we got comedians, uh, hamburger, you know, uh, man, come on, everybody. We, we from Elizabeth, New Jersey, man. Word of mouth MCs from Elizabeth, New Jersey. You know, big shout out to my brother DJ Cheese from Plainfield. But it's just a Jersey thing, man. You know, a lot of people don't know I'm from Jersey because I move in so many different areas. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, can you take us back to some of your earlier music musical influences before you got into music yourself? Who was uh, Bon Lee listening to earlier on? Oh, everything my father put on the eight track or on the turntable, and that was OJ's. Um, whispers, uh, all slow. You know, I, I love slow music. I, I grew up in bars, so I listened to a lot of bar jukebox music and things like that. Cause so when I first started DJing, I was DJing with my father at 12 years old. Wow. You know, so I'm in bars where I'm not supposed to be at, but I'm listening to all that music. So that's my influences before, you know, I started just going to buy my own records. The first record I ever bought with my own money was Bootzilla by Boosie Collins. Crazy. Yeah. What was your uh, earliest memory uh, of hip hop firsthand? What did uh, Bon Lee see firsthand on the block? Uh, was it talent shows? Was it a concert? What did you see firsthand uh, back in the day? I saw rap music before they were saying it was hip hop, you know, because my uncle was a DJ and he had people rapping for him. He had a rapper called Rapper D and that was in 78, 79, you know, before the wave, the new renaissance of what we now call hip hop had came. So um, I had tapes of Flash and then once I heard Super Rapping, I went, started searching for tapes. So if you want to say that, but I, you know, all around DJ and I've been around DJ and all my life, my uncles was DJs. I'm from a DJ town. It's DJ Neil, rest in peace. Like these people were giving block parties when we were living in the projects way before I ever started DJing. How did uh, Von Lee get into hip hop? Was DJing your first uh, foray? A lot of uh, DJs would say break dancing or graffiti. What was your first foray into hip hop? I didn't get into hip hop. Hip hop got into me. You know what I'm saying? I was already doing what I was doing. And it just went, it's music to me. I don't I don't really separate genres like everybody else. I, and I always tell people that I'm genreless when it comes to it. And, and when I actually knew what genres was, I used to work in a record shop. So, you know, I buy everything. I don't just buy certain kinds of music. But in a record shop, you have to separate it so it's easy for a person to come in and buy and move out. You know, come get what you got to get, move out. Me, I was always looking at all the records because it was never a certain genre of music that I was stuck to. Right. Yeah. So at what point you say you were DJing at 12? Uh, how did you get into DJing initially? I did my first party at 11, and that, that's where I got the bug from. I did my birthday party at 11, and I, was, uh, I had to borrow records from my man who was a DJ, and uh, Ricky Murray, first court. So I lived in the second court, but I hung with his brother, me and his brother, all of us were best friends. And we borrowed as many records as we could for my birthday party because we didn't have enough money to have a DJ. So I did my first party with a lot of his records and a few of the records that I bought. Like I said, Bootzilla was one of those records and some other records. But I went uh, changing records from the eight track to the, the hi-fi. So I'm going eight track to record, eight track to record, keeping the party going. So... That's how I did my first party. I wasn't really a DJ then. I can't say I was a DJ, but that is my first party. And from there, uh, my father moved back with us the next year, and he had DJ equipment already, and he was playing in the bar, so I started playing with him. At uh, what point did you start to uh, take uh, DJing seriously and, and know that it could be a career move for you? <laughs> 12 years old. 13, I told my mother I'm not doing nothing else. I'm going to be a DJ. <laughs> She said, hey, you're going to have to need a real job to survive. And uh, 
I just been a DJ, man. I, I worked a couple of odd jobs till 1987. That was when I worked my last job. And the first job I've received the check in since then is right now at Rock the Bells Radio. This I, That's my first time working since 1987. That's very dope. Um, were you into producing earlier on or that, did that come later on uh, during your career? <laughs> It, it was like a natural transition, like, because we were having ideas of what we wanted to do for records. And, you know, once we had got down with Molly and he we sampled kicks and snares and pulled stuff from records, I knew records. And I said, yo, that's, you know, so that probably is where the bug came from. But we already had ideas that we wanted to do for records because you want to do this record over, you want to do that record over, you got this idea, you want to do that idea. But I didn't know I was producing because I had my own ideas until 45 King told me this is what a producer does. You know, like, okay, you bring in the records, you telling them where the stuff go at, you arranging the record, you know, you're a producer. So I, I didn't know that, you know, so it, right. it might sound crazy right now, but I honestly was just in it for the love of it. And Biz wanted to make records. That was never my dream to make records. Biz right. make records and we just did it man and my sister Sharon that was her vision of me and Biz doing it together so that just happened like that uh before Lincoln with the Biz of course he's your cousin but what kind of dues was Bon Lee uh paying earlier on uh to get his name out there Pay? Pay, paying dues what kind of dues were you paying pay nobody <laughs> <laughs> Now, I uh, I uh, uh, no, but I was trying to get my name known. Like I said, I was on known in the older people's parties. I got, I was doing older parties, so I got known for you know just doing a party, and then. But my father's name was on the flyers, and on the billboards. So when I was playing with him, I was playing up under him. So I would got to say that's where I paid my dues at because that's where I really honed my craft, and knew how to do a party for five hours straight mm. stop you know and then right. beyond that because then they used to have these round robins so you dj for 12 hours then i used to dj in brooklyn at the after hour spot you dj for 24 hours we'll start three in the afternoon and won't stop till like 11 o'clock in the morning the next day sometimes sometimes we don't stop till three o'clock in the afternoon the next day depending on when the crowd leaves so you you know so that's how i hone my craft those was the dues paying days but, you know. Right. And like I said earlier, uh, your cousin's the legendary Biz Marquis. Um, at what point did you guys link and what were you witnessing with him earlier on? Well, Biz just had a, a, a spirit that he wanted to get on. He wanted, <laughs> Biz wanted to be somebody. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you, if you notice, he's a combination of a whole lot of people. So it's right. a whole lot of influence in the Biz. So he, you know, he was in influenced by the L brothers and Cold Crush and everybody like that. But we took it seriously in 84, 85, around that time. Like, you know, that's when we really said, yo, we're going to do this. And I bought him to Jersey and we never looked back, you know, from Long Island. You know, most of my family's out in Long Island. So I bought him over from Long Island, took him to Jersey, and then we just started doing it from there. What was that early creative process like between you two? Well, honestly... Biz was his own talent, you know, because he beatbox and he's rhyming. He wants to do a whole lot of things. So me, I'm DJing. So I command the party regardless because I have my own sound system. I come to the party and Biz would have his part where he would get on and just, you know, take over the crowd. And that's what he loves to do. Biz loves the crowd. He, loved, he loves being that person where all eyes are on him. You know, right. me, I could play the back a little bit and do what I do. And make it happen. But Biz loves to be, you know, he loves showtime. Showtime. Right. <laughs> I asked you earlier about yourself as a solo DJ. What kind of dues did you guys pay? What kind of places did you go to to hone your craft? And what was the reaction you were getting from the crowds? I got a great reaction everywhere. But my father told me that uh, I sound like a, a good-ass tape deck. <laughs> <laughs> because my mic game wasn't up. See, my father would talk on the mic while I was DJing. But it'd be times he would be going in the bar and drink and do whatever. And I got the party going, but I'm not letting people know it's me doing it. So they, you know, I'm playing the turntables, but I'm a little kid on the turntables. And I had to learn how to work the mic. So I, I always 
tell people that my father told me to get on that mic and tell people who I am. And that's what really, I mean, that's for that, that's the basic dues I paid because, you know, in those kind of parties, you can't play what you like. You got to play what they like. So that's right. why I learned how to play all the music that my age group wasn't necessarily playing at the YMCA, at the gyms, at the school and all of that. I learned how to play different stuff to make the crowd happy and incorporate a little bit of the music they didn't like, but keep them dancing. Right. You know, so that's why I paid those dudes at them bars and them, them clubs and them, them early weddings and uh, right. family get togethers. Those were, that's, that's the most dues I paid right there. I, I laid a lot of groundwork there. And as far as the biz goes, what kind of uh, shows were you guys doing earlier on to get you guys' name out there? Gyms. Uh, <clears throat> we had a promoter around my way uh, named Ahmed, and he had the gyms. He could get all the buildings. So you, he had venues like uh, Mr. West and Elizabeth was a hotel. He had the YWCA. He had Jefferson High School. He had a lot of places where you just couldn't go rent these places out. And him and his family had a hookup. Whatever that hookup was, they got every building. They got the Ritz theaters. They got everything in Elizabeth. Any spot that you could perform in Elizabeth, and not only Elizabeth, uh, he had spot. They had, used to get spots down in Lakewood and down South Jersey. So, and they would bring in talent. So that's how I got me and Biz was performing. I brought Biz out there to perform with me because I used to be doing the parties with them. I tried to get down with them at first. They said I wasn't ready. Right. <laughs> So this is a funny story. So they said I wasn't ready. And then whoever was DJing for them, I guess, didn't work out or didn't show up. And they called me. And then I had to charge them because now it's not about me getting down, which was about me doing what I do. And I get paid for this. So they actually, from, we started a good relationship because I got paid for every party that was at the Y that I did. So I can't say I was paying dues because I was actually making money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely wasn't paying dues as long as you make the money. <laughs> but it was definitely a uh, necessary groundwork into the rap side of things because right. now these are younger parties, the parties I like doing. Right. Most people my age didn't know I DJed like that. They knew me from sports. They knew me from other things. But I'm playing in bars every night from Tuesday to Sunday. I'm in the bars all the way to 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Then I'm going to school. Right. You see what I'm saying? So Right. Uh, before getting on, did you guys frequent spots like the Latin Quarters, Rooftop? And what were you guys to. seeing? Yeah. yeah. What, what was you guys seeing? That was like the training ground, right? Latin Quarter was the, the melting pot because people came from all over the world. That was tourist section. So you in, you in Times Square. So Latin Quarter is a real fun Tuesday night where rap was going down at. You know, we honed our craft in there. As far as the music business is concerned, that was where we honed our craft because everybody met up at Latin Quarter at a point. Now, when we're making records, rooftop is more of the play. Going uptown. Uptown is a whole nother world. So now if you don't rock uptown, you're getting booed. That's, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So now, before we're doing the rooftop, before we're doing Latin Quarter, we're doing Mike and Dave up in Harlem. So Mike and Dave was our training grounds. That's Mike and Dave is like, boot camp right and then you got so this is just uptown new york city so you got rooftop that's you know the next th next thing and then apollo from there you 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 ready after you rock the rooftop you go to the apollo so that's three places in new york city you have to be able to rock and get your your point across La um, latin quarter that's you know that was easy because everybody's there hanging out you don't really get booed in Latin Quarter that much. 